One day, a father and his son were taking their donkey to sell at the market. Not long into their journey, they met a group of merchants. The merchants told the father that he should allow his son to ride on the donkey. The father thought that this was a good idea and sat his son on the donkey. After a while, they came across a group of men who started scolding the son. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? You should let your father ride on the donkey. The son quickly got down from the donkey and asked his father to get on and they continued their journey. Further along the dusty road, they encountered an old lady who declared, You must be the most uncaring father I've ever come across. Your poor young son has to walk while you rest lazily on the donkey. The father got down and told his son to climb on the donkey. After more walking, they came across a wise old man who suggested, Why don't both of you sit on the donkey and let the donkey do the walking? The man thought that this was a good idea and he got on the donkey too. After some distance, they saw a group of farmers. These farmers observed, You are going to kill the donkey with both of you riding it. See how tired the donkey looks. Nobody will want to buy it. The man then asked the farmers, So, what should we do? The farmers told him, Both of you should carry the donkey instead, so that the donkey can recover and look good before you reach the market. The father and his son found a strong tree branch and tied the donkey's legs to the branch and carried the donkey upside down. As this strange looking party was crossing a bridge, the donkey struggled so much that it fell into the river and drowned. Moral of the story, everyone has their own opinion and most people express their opinions very freely. Opinions are not facts, they cannot be taken wholeheartedly. Critical thinking is a framework that you can use to question the logic and reasoning behind the opinions. Previously, we have looked at establishing credibility of evidence. How do we determine if a piece of evidence or information that we have is credible or otherwise? And in the past episodes, we have looked at personal evidence, especially eyewitness accounts, from the point of view of the motives. What is the motive of the person who is giving the account? Now we'll move on and look at other factors that need to be examined. Because just because an evidence is credible, does it mean that it's conclusive? Does it mean that it's complete? Does it mean that it's clear? Does it mean that it's unquestionable? No, there are other factors that need to be considered. And when you become a critical thinker, it is similar to being a detective. A detective is a very good example of a critical thinker. So is a scientist. Both view evidence from a very structured point of view to see whether information is credible or otherwise. The second factor after the motive that we need to look at is the condition of the observation. The observation condition when the incident happened. Let's use a few examples to illustrate this principle. Let's look at this example. A goal has just been scored and the referee is present. He's seen the goal being scored. But let's say that the goal is disputed. Various parties say that this goal is not valid, but the referee says that it is. Other eyewitnesses maintain it's not a valid goal. What happens? Well. Let's look at the credibility of the eyewitness, the referee. Is the referee a vested party? Is he neutral? Can he be relied upon to tell us the truth? Yes, he can. A referee is a neutral party 
and he has his personal reputation at stake. He has to tell the truth. But the question remains that although the referee is a credible witness, did he have the ability to observe the goal correctly? We need to ask a number of questions. Was his eyesight obstructed? Did other players come into his vision that he couldn't see properly what was going on? Was there an injured player lying on the ground? Was the referee's vision obstructed? That's the first question we have to ask. Then we have to ask, how far away was the referee from the incident? In this case, the goalpost. What was the distance? Was he at a distance comfortable enough for him to see clearly what was going on? Or was he too far away? That's the second thing you have to ask. The third thing, what was his angle of viewing? Was he standing at an angle which allowed him to see the goal happening clearly? Or was he not? That's the third thing. The fourth is how was visibility during that time? How was lighting? How was the sky? Was it dark? Was it bright? Was it cloudy? Was visibility poor? Was it good? The fifth question you have to ask, how much of the incident did the referee actually see? Was he present at the site before the goal happened? Did he run in halfway? Did he actually arrive at the end of the goal? When did he get there? That's an important question. When did he start observing? In other words, what we're trying to determine is, did he see the whole incident or did he see part of it? Next question, was he distracted? Were there other things happening that distracted him? For example, was there noise outside? Was there a road crash outside? Did, was an ambulance passing by with the siren blaring? Were the spectators making a lot of noise and was the referee distracted? Were other players causing a commotion, making the referee not focus on what was going on? Were there distractions? Then you have to ask, how is his vision? Does he have long sight problems? Does he have short sightedness? Does he suffer from night blindness if it was a night match? What's his personal vision capability? Inventing is a combination of brains and materials. The more brains you use, the less material you need. So apart from establishing the credibility of the evidence, we have to focus on the ability of the eyewitness to observe the incident correctly. And as we mentioned, there are some key questions that you have to ask. You have to ask, were there obstructions? Number one. Number two. What was the distance involved? Number three, what was the angle? Was the angle suitable for the eyewitness to observe the incident correctly? Number four, what were visibility conditions? How was visibility? Poor visibility or good visibility? Number five, was the eyewitness distracted? Were there other things happening that caused the eyewitness to lose focus? Number six, when did the eyewitness actually arrive at the incident? Before the incident, during the incident, or after the incident? And lastly, how was the vision, or how is the vision of the eyewitness? 
Does he have any vision problems? Now let's apply all these questions to another scenario. A robbery has just taken place and an eyewitness observed the robbery. The policeman asks the eyewitness for her account. Tell us, what did you see? Can you identify the robber? Now, when the witness gives her statement or her account or her evidence, we as critical thinkers have to ask the same questions that we discussed just now. Number one, the distance. How far away was the witness, the eyewitness from the robber? Was she close enough to make a positive identification or was she too far to see the face? What was the angle of the view? Was she standing or sitting or was she in a position that allowed her a clear look at the face or was she not? Third, were there obstructions in the way that blocked her view that could prevent her from correctly identifying the robber? Fourth, how was visibility at that time when the incident happened? Was there sufficient lighting? Was it dark? Was it bright? Was there enough light for the witness to identify the robber? You see, being a critical thinker involves becoming a detective. So you have to think like a detective. How is the witness's vision? Does she suffer from long-sightedness or short-sightedness or night blindness? You have to ask this question. Was she distracted during the robbery? Did she panic? Was she focused on something else that was going on? Or was she looking at the robber face to face? Was she present from the beginning of the robbery? Or did she walk in halfway? Or did she arrive after the robber had done his deed and was on the way out? How much of it did she see? We have to ask these questions. In other words, we have to ask what was the ability of the eyewitness to correctly witness the incident? Well, an eyewitness may provide credible evidence, may be in a position to correctly observe what was going on. The third question we have to ask is, does the eyewitness have the relevant expertise to correctly interpret what happened? Let's look at a few examples to illustrate this point. We have an eyewitness who says that man collapsed from a heart attack and died. So you see a picture of a man lying on the floor, dead, and you see the picture of an eyewitness. And she says he collapsed from a heart attack and died. Can we take her word when she says that the man collapsed and died of a heart attack? Well, we have to ask some questions. Does the eyewitness have the relevant expertise to determine that the man had a heart attack? How do we know that he died from a heart attack? How do we know that he didn't die from something else? Is the eyewitness a medical doctor? If she is, then she may have the relevant expertise. If she isn't, then we have to disregard that part of her evidence. A house has caught fire. An eyewitness saw the house burning and the eyewitness says that the faulty electrical wiring caused the house to catch fire. Now we have to ask the relevant expertise question. Does this eyewitness have the relevant expertise to determine that it is faulty electrical wiring that caused the house to catch fire? Or was it something else? If the eyewitness is an electrician, then she has the relevant expertise. If she's not, she saw the house burning, but she doesn't have the ability to determine what caused the fire. So we have to look at the background of the person, the background of the eyewitness, to determine if she or he has the relevant expertise. After eyewitness evidence, we now look at hearsay evidence. This is different in the sense that the person who is reporting the evidence is not the person who observed the incident. For example, look at this incident. A person says, someone told me that a motorcycle hit this woman and injured her. 
You see a woman lying on the ground, you see the person who's making the statement, and you see another person. The individual who is making the statement is not the one who saw the incident, but heard about it from a third person. This is called hearsay evidence. Another example. A man says, the security guard told me that this man conducted the robbery. Now this man, the one who is giving the evidence, is not the man who saw the event take place. He is relating what somebody else has told him. This is hearsay evidence, where the person reporting it has not personally witnessed the incident. The information is second-hand. It is coming from somebody else. Because it's coming from someone else, hearsay evidence is not as strong as an eyewitness account. We cannot give it the same level of importance. The first reason is that we are not sure if the actual eyewitness observed the event correctly. We are not hearing about the incident from the eyewitness personally. We are hearing about it from a second party. So we don't know what the eyewitness actually observed. Apply the same rules. What's the motive of the actual eyewitness? What's the ability to observe of the eyewitness? What's the relevant expertise of the eyewitness? We don't know because we are not getting the evidence directly from the eyewitness. We're getting it from someone else. This is hearsay evidence. Second reason is what the eyewitness told the person who's reporting it may be different from what the person is telling us. So the original account from the eyewitness to this person may have been changed when the person relates it to us. Through the steps, information could be added, it could be omitted, it could be exaggerated, it could be changed, deliberately or accidentally. A number of things could happen. Because of these reasons, hearsay evidence is not as strong as a personal eyewitness account. I had six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were where and what and when, and why and how and who. The next part of evidence that we have to examine is character reference. Let's take a scenario. Ali is accused of theft. Now, Ali's brother says that Ali is a very honest guy. He says there is no way on earth Ali could have stolen the money. This is a character witness report. Ali's brother is giving a character reference report. Another example. Mark's employer is saying that Mark has worked for me for at least three years. He has not been involved in any accidents at all. He is a very good driver. Mark is being accused of causing an accident. Mark's employer says Mark's been working for him for three years and as far as he can tell, Mark is very responsible, very good driver. There's no way Mark could have caused an accident. This is a character reference. In both cases, the character reference is not talking about the incident itself. In the first case, the character reference is not addressing whether Ali stole the money or not. In the second incident, the character reference is not 
specifying that Mark did not or could not have caused the accident. A character reference doesn't refer to the present incident. It's always historical. It's a reference about a person, about how the person was or is earlier on. Not now, not in the present and not in the future. To summarize, apart from looking at the credibility of the evidence, we have to examine the perception and interpretation of the evidence. The person who has observed an incident happening, does he or she have the relevant expertise? Does he or she have the ability to see the event happening as it did happen? The ability to observe and the relevant expertise combined are called perception and interpretation. When this is combined with credibility of evidence, we get closer towards establishing the true picture. When we examine the ability to observe, we have to ask the key questions. The distance the eyewitness was from the incident, the angle, the visibility, and various other key questions that we covered during this episode. When we look at relevant expertise, we have to ask, does this person have the relevant expertise to interpret the event correctly? He may have seen it happen, but does he have the expertise to understand what actually did happen? So we have to combine these two with the credibility of evidence. These then have to be applied towards eyewitness accounts, hearsay evidence, as well as character references. As we discussed, a hearsay account is not as strong as an eyewitness account because the person reporting it wasn't present when it happened. A character reference, on the other hand, is about history, what has happened in the past, not what's happening now or what can happen in the future. Thank you.